Welcome from the news capital of the world. It's Jonathan Honig along with Nikos for the Daily Objective. We're delighted you're with us. It's a studio audience. Well, I shouldn't say it's a studio audience. It's an international audience from around the world. Uh, we have subscribers and listeners and viewers tuning in from the UK, from the US, from North and South America, from all around the globe. And we're delighted to have you with us today. And on a very interesting topic, a timely topic, something that when people think of uh, Ayn Rand, you know, Nikos, they always think of, oh, I know Ayn Rand, it's, it's all about uh, capitalism, or maybe they might say it's all about individual rights if, if, if we're lucky or even selfishness. What they don't know is that Rand had a whole theory of art, of aesthetics. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today and what's kicking off our discussion. First of all, welcome. It's great to be with you. You know, Nikos is one of the few uh, 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 hosts who's so esteemed that he actually has his own T-shirt. Uh, which is something pretty badass. So definitely pick up a, a copy of Nikos's t-shirt, but it's great to see you. Great to see you. A t-shirt which is not sanctioned by me, it's merely tolerated by me. Well, become a member, you can pick one up and, and, and definitely enjoy that as well. Um, but what prompted this discussion, Nikos, is, as you know, uh, some very, well, I don't know if you'd say necessarily beautiful artwork. Maybe you wouldn't even call it artwork at all. Uh, what are you looking? What are we looking at here now? Let's invite all of our our viewers to, to catch up. What are we looking at there? Well, that is a piece of artwork supposedly called "Take the Money and Run" by an artist by the name of Jens Haining. Now, if you're just coming new to this story, a Danish I'll fill you in, a Danish museum gave an artist eighty four thousand dollars to reproduce an old work about labor. He pocketed the money, he delivered blank canvases, and he called it conceptual art with take the money and run. Now, a lot of people don't know the follow-up to this. He actually told a Danish radio program, I'm quoting now, that it's not theft, it's a breach of contract, and breach of contract is part of the work. This is quoting again. The work is that I have taken their money, hence take the money and run. So Nico, so I know you said in the precursors we talked a bit before the show, you're not an art critic and you don't know much about art, but let's just get your, before we get into Ms. Rand's perspective, perhaps, your off the cuff take on not just the blank canvases, but on this whole notion that this artist's artwork is pocketing the money and, and running. Is this a, a new low or... Well, it's not a necessarily a new law because why, for example, is this a new law when the, you know, the toilet or you could name, there are many famous examples of this type of art and uh, again, people find value in them. I personally do not. The, the, what I find interesting is that there you have literally nothing. You have, so in a way, it's the best, uh, it's, a, it's, it's the best materialization of this type of art because you have literally nothing. And there have been other, there have been other, for example, uh, art exhibitions where also you have literally nothing. So having literally nothing there is not uh, something new. And the point, there's always an explanation. The point is you have to contemplate. So here the point is that often we have to break from these structures that in a way, uh, in a way alienate us or oppress us. And this is not new. So back in the day, mostly in the early 60s, early to mid 60s, there were some quasi-artistic, quasi-political movements in Europe. They started with the Lettrists, then most famously with the Situationist in France. And the idea was that art and politics need not to be, uh, need to be united in a way. So your politics needs to be artistic. That's why you have with the Situationist their very cool slogans. It is forbidden to forbid. Uh, who wants to live in a world where the guarantee that we will not die of starvation includes the guarantee that we'll die of boredom and all this trendy cool stuff, but also art that becomes politics. So your art needs to say something. Now, of course, my answer to this is that good art is always telling you something about the world. So for example, take a, take a, I will take a communist uh, artist. If you take the Sostakovich music, take the Leningrad symphony, it tells you something about life. It's beautiful, but it also inspires you to do stuff. It, it, it kind of puts you in, a, in, in the mindset it, it that has, I need to do heroic it, stuff. It, it, 
it has a it has i mean i'm this is my own interpretation but it has probably perhaps what Rand would call a sense of life about it you know and, it and has a sense of life and what is what the sense of life mean so i don't want to give a definition but i will i will put it i will i will put it this way so for Rand, the most important thing is how do i view the the artist with his or her work they tell you how do i view the world so for example uh, some uh, she says sartre views the world via his uh, protagonist as confused directionless and you don't know what uh, that the world makes no sense dostoevsky has heroes who are however uh, because that the world is a bad place defeated Whereas Ayn Rand sees the world via Howard Rohr or via Henry Rarden. Now, again, the, with modern art, in a way, it's it's very expressive of the values of maybe these artists or the, of the ideology or of the culture they represent because you have nothing there. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, I would say it is telling. It's it's nothing, Nikos. And I think to your point too, it's you know, so this Danish artist cooked up a blank cam a blank canvas. And some of our super chatters and our chatters saying, you know what, well, he wants to be provocative. But Nikos, just to your point, it's nothing new. Uh, I, we're going to share some screens here. This is Robert Rauschenberg from 1951. Look at that. It's a blank friggin'. Oh, I'm sorry. It's three blank canvases. Sorry, but major distinction here. Here's an artist by the name of Kazmir Malkovich, 1918. White on white. Okay, so here's... Here's a Piero, Piero Mazzoni, 1958, Adachrome, a big white canvas. Joe Bear, 1929, white canvas. Another white canvas. Luce Chai, white canvas. Agnes Martin, white canvas. So it's, it's not like this is any even something new or radical in the art world. Some of the super chatters are talking about, you know, Duchamp. Well, Duchamp was, you know, something new. This isn't even recently new. Here's a, a article from 2019. This is just a couple of years ago. An artist by the name of Robert Ryman had an had an all white painting auctioned off for 20 million dollars. So it's not like even this Danish artist is is being even that provocative or new. Now, Nikos, what would be new? Hey, sorry, is, who please, is yeah, he ahead. provoking? If he's provocative, who is he provoking? He's knocking on an open door. And again, here I'm not talking about the artist. Maybe you know the artist. It was kind of clever. I took the money and I ran. But quite often you see this 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 idea that this art is provocative. Who is it provoking? Do you well, know and, what and art can, I think is provocative? Can you even use the term it's, art? Can you even use the term artist? I mean, it, it, it's just isn't it just a theft? It's <laughs> just thievery. I mean, I have some rant quotes I want to share about about art. But you know, I mean, look, if he even wanted to be creative Nikos he could have done you know an ad Reinhardt at least on the black painting right I mean mix it up a little bit or do like what they're doing now they're doing an invisible artwork this is a London gallery in 2012 an invisible artwork so you know at least shake it up a little bit the white canvas has already been done and is this even an artist I know I think Rand would have a lot to say about that so I might trigger many people who I know they hate this statue if this is from my Instagram post For me, this is radical art. Okay, you don't see, you can't see it very well. It's it's from London Saint Pancras Station, and it's called. Okay, the camera won't zoom. Anyway, it's a it's a statue of a couple which is embracing with urgency, and you see a man and a woman, and they have this passion. They have this. It's as if you can feel the the you can feel the polarity and the energy, and it's very big. And the guy looks like a guy. The girl looks like a girl. There's nothing quote conceptual that you have to guess. You see it. You see two passionate people embracing and kissing. They're probably before a trip because the guy is having a, a bug. If you Google, if you Google uh, King's Cross and Pancreas statue, the travelers, you will see it. So most people say, okay, that's boring. There's nothing. There's just a guy kissing a girl. For me, whenever I travel through Saint Pancreas, again, the guy who doesn't understand art, I see this and I enjoy it. It tells me something. It's it's how does Rand call it? This is what life means to me. She says this is what art in in an essay called Art and Sense of Life. So the values involved in life and the works naming the emotions are this is what life means to me. 
So for run, this is this is the point of art. So that's why I see the embracing couple in St. Pancreas, which is considered by many that they hate it. I have a response to it, whereas to this, I have no response. I don't even have anger. I don't even have remorse. I don't even have bitterness. It's just literally, there's nothing there. There, there, is, there's literally, there is literally nothing there. You know, there is something, though, with our community. Thank you, Robert, for your contributions. Mary Lean, for your contributions. Sammy is bored again. Thank you for your contributions. Mary Lean, we really appreciate your, as they say, keeping the, the lights running, keeping the art on the walls here at the Ayn Rand Center Institute. You know, and Nikos, you were quoting a little bit from Rand's Romantic Manifesto, I believe there, which, you know, doesn't get the airtime, if you will, as, as uh, you know, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal or, or some of Rand's other works. But we're going to share some quotes from this. This is really a, 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 a wonderful, very, very different, I think, side of Rand, at least for me, one that's still very interesting and challenging. But, you know, as long as all this artwork is going for, you know, tens of thousands of millions, Nikos, I, I just wanted to offer up to our super chat uh, viewers, this is a pinch pot I made when I was eight years old. Um, I'll let it go for, well, let's just start the bidding at 10,000 if anyone really wants it. I can't say it's totally conceptual, but, you know, I did sign it. You can see there I actually did sign it. So um, let, let's just throw that up there if anyone wants to uh, make a bid at this point. So do we have a bidders? <laughs> no, all right. Well, let's Let's skip the bitters though. Let's go to um, some of Rand's comments on this. Perhaps what would she think of it? This is the original Romantic Manifesto, the cover. And this, our, uh, this uh, work is full of such great zingers, Nikos. Rand says, I don't know what is worse, to practice modern art as a colossal fraud or to do it sincerely. And I almost remember Dr. Peikoff at, at some point in one of his lectures, you know, it could be modernism and madness, which is a Ford Hall form lecture he gave where he talks about something effective like, you know, these modern artists just like, they're laughing. They're either sneering or laughing at the whole idea of what is art. So Rand says, I don't know what's worse, you know, to practice it sincerely or to do it as a fraud. And you almost, it's, it's both simultaneously somehow. I'm muted. So in, in a way, yeah, in, in a way, this is, actually showing the finger so this type of art is showing the finger to people who at least try to do something way more significant and again someone will say this is because you haven't studied modern arts and if you go to an art museum to a modern art museum who someone who knows they're going to show you stuff and they will tell you this comes from this and this is why this is difficult and there might be something there but let me tell me my experience with with art whenever i try to persuade myself that I like a piece of art, it's a waste of time and it's a, I don't get anything from it. So I went through a period in my life around uh, when I was 23, 24, 25, where I was trying to persuade myself that I like the art that was I supposed to like. What does it mean, the art that I was supposed to like? So I was a leftist. So I was supposed to like these films. I was supposed to like these books. I was supposed to like this, this music. So I remember reading a book which I was told is the best book ever written. It was, a, it was an early Soviet book. I almost got absolutely nothing from the book. It was a chore reading it. When I finished this, I never wanted to touch it again. But I, if you ask me, what's your favorite book? I say, yeah, that's my favorite book. Or I would watch a film that I had... I was told that this is the best film ever. And I was so much pushing myself towards understanding it. And then I would tell to myself, yeah, that was great. And what this means is I was a second hander. I was a second hander in the way Keating is when he reads these ridiculous books in the Fountainhead that he doesn't understand them. And the fact that he doesn't understand them makes the experience more, quote, uh, authentic or more or a deeper experience. So... I'm a bit absolutist to this. If I need an eight-hour lecture to even start understanding what's happening there, then probably that art is not for me. Life is too short for that. There's so much art that I respond to. And uh, I mentioned, for example, Sostakovich or Ayn Rand or uh, Michelangelo, whatever, whatever type of arts or, people want. Yeah, or even like, you know, Monet, Vermeer, Rembrandt. I mean, here's a... 
Again, a quote for, from Rand. I hope people can see this. A couple of people in the chat have said, you know, Rand says, as a recreation of reality, an artwork has to be representational. Its freedom of stylization is limited by the requirement of intelligibility. If it doesn't present an intelligible subject, it ceases to be art. So, I mean, these white canvases, it's, it's not even art. As you said, Nikos, it's like a joke being played on everyone who participates in it. Dr you know, drinking their little martinis saying, oh, this is so impressive and so meaningful. And oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's like, it's all a joke. I've put on the on the chat the Saint Pancreas uh, statue that I like. Uh, the name is uh, the name is uh, where where is it? Anyway, you'll see it, you'll see it in the you'll see it in the chat. So so yeah, that's 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 my point. That if you if you have to stay and stare and pretend that you like it, you are wasting your time. It's not an honor, honorable activity because you are basically a second hander and. There's way better things to do in life. Actually, I would say, for example, if you enjoy football more, go watch football. It's way more important than pretending to like something that you don't like, but you're supposed to like because other people like it. So looking back to all this time that I've spent listening to music that I didn't really like or watching films that I didn't really like, I think it was a complete waste of my, uh, waste of my time. Well, and, you know, and Nikos, I, I don't think it, you know, I, I guess I, I would just encourage everyone to discover Rand's theory of art. There's a lot of talk on the chat. Thank you, uh, by the way, Sammy, once again. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen says that she thinks the trillionaire would love my pinch pot. And uh, I'm assuming the bids are going straight to the Ayn Rand Center UK headquarters. I would say at least 10, 15,000 for this. Don't you think, Nikos? I mean, early Jonathan Honig. Um, but we definitely well, encourage I you. I have uh, the mature Jonathan Honig, so. <laughs> that's, that's the new book. Well, thank you. And, and, and I have yours as well. We encourage everyone to read that as, as well, but certainly pick up Miss Rands. And, you know, she has, you know, I, I'm having trouble sharing the screen, but she, she writes, Nikos, something made by an artist is not a definition of art. Something in a frame hung on a wall is not the definition of a painting. I'm, I'm, uh, Moving along here, she says, I, this is such a, it's tough language, but she says, blades of grass glued on a sheet of paper to represent grass might be good occupational therapy for retarded children, though I doubt it, but it is not art because I felt like it is not a definition or validation of anything. So she just got such, she's got a lot of great zingers in here. And when the practitioners of modern arts declare that they don't know what they are doing or what makes them do it, we should take their word for it and give them no further consideration, which is kind of what you said, Nikos, is that you, it doesn't even wash over you and you tune it out immediately as you probably should. And two more things on that, because again, someone say, okay, then why do you bother? Well, we bother for two reasons. One, it's indicative. It's indicative of a general tendency, which says, don't judge. Don't judge. There is no good and bad art. Everything is art. Well, if everything is art, First of all, then nothing is art. And if everything is art, what you're saying is what you say to the giants that have created this stuff that lifts our soul, you're telling them that you're as good as the guy who created the, the white thing, which is the same morally as going to someone who has created, I don't know, who has given you Amazon or the vaccine or who has made in some way your life better and telling me you are as good as someone who has produced nothing. And actually you owe that someone who has produced nothing. So it's the same lack of standards that is annoying me. It's the same lack of standards that I find of very bad taste, even worse taste of the art, because it's not something which is only there in the art. So, or when we say, for example, in social sciences that, well, you can never judge, you know, someone is a criminal, but you don't know what happened in their childhood. So again, the same thing. Everything is the same as everything else. And nothing is really better than something else. And then this becomes a way of life. And one more thing. And, 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 yeah, and that's, that's an egalitarianism, right, Nikos? That, you know, you can't really judge every... That, that you know, uh, um, uh, Vermeer is the same as when they give uh, an elephant a paintbrush and just let the elephant do this. That those are the same thing. They're both art. You can't judge, right? That's that egalitarianism at work. 
And many people will say, well, Rand here is caricature. Then she makes the same in uh, her novels that there are authors who write uh, in bursts of unconscious. It's... But this is actually happening. So Jack Kerouac, for example, I think uh, in, in one of the books he wrote in Paris, and I think Paris is even in the title, he says that he wrote it in a, almost in a delirium of sleepless delirium where the words were just pouring out. Again, I don't see the merit of it. It's, I don't see the merit of my mind is throwing up stuff. I mean, maybe the result is there's something to it, but the fact that this is considered, oh, it's very authentic because he was writing in a delirium. To be honest, I, I never, again, I never got this and I can't respond to this. So I read Kero, that particular book by Kerouac. I had no response to it. Of course, yeah, it's, while it's I was funny. reading it, I was it, like, oh, that's profound. But there was it's, nothing there. It's very, it's fascinating because, I mean, I, I've been weeding out some books lately and I, I found my copy and in, interesting you mentioned Kerouac and literature now and Iran talks about that in Romantic Manifesto as well. But, you know, I had the same experience when I read On the Road in college. I thought that was kind of the hip, cool thing to do. It was, as kind of borrowing a line from Ms. Rand, it was unintelligible to me. It was just like blabbering on with kind of no middle start or finish, not going anywhere. And it left me feeling if, like if, I, if, if he wasn't on mushrooms when he was writing this, then I was when I was reading it. It was, it was just, um, it was kind of blither blather. And Here, that is seemingly what so much of modern, so-called modern art is. Okay, I, we've made this like a anti-Jack Kerouac, but here's my on the road experience. I couldn't wait to read on the road because I have heard all these things. So I kept it to read it in the army. So I was like, I'm going to be in the army. I'm going to be exactly in the mood to use this book as an escape. And this was the first months in the army, which were not particularly hard. So I was bored. And yet the book was so boring that it gave me zero sense of freedom. It didn't bring me to a place where, oh yeah, I'm riding my bike and I'm free. It's, as you said, there's, there's no beginning, no middle, no end, nothing particularly happens. But anyway, somehow we ended up uh, discussing uh, Jack Kerouac and uh, yeah, he's not necessarily yeah, I mean a nihilist like the, the, or the uh, conceptual art people, but Again, uh, personally, I never found much in him. Well, here's, here's again, uh, quoting from Rand, and we'll avoid, uh, invite everyone to join us on Clubhouse in just a few minutes to, to further the discussion. She writes in the Romantic Manifesto, there is no place for the unknowable, the unintelligible, the undefinable, the non-objective in any human product. This side of an same asylum, the actions of human being are motivated by a conscious purpose. When they are not, they are of no interest to anyone outside of a psychotherapist's office. So maybe it's that, because it's like that, that kind of stream of consciousness going with whatever, you, you know, that's perfect for a psychotherapist's office, but spewing it out onto the page or in a canvas doesn't qualify as art, at least yeah. in my book. And, and it doesn't sound like Rand's either. Yeah. And don't get me started with other works like James Joyce. Although James Joyce has one of my favorite lines, that the book that is otherwise a nerve, says, History is a nightmare from which I can't wake up or something like that. So that makes it even worse. It shows that the guy has talent. The guy can write beautiful lines. And yet 98% of the book is impossible to... But why do we, why do we even uh, criticize the novelist? Isn't modern philosophy a bit like that? Like, have you tried reading some of modern philosophers? Have you tried lead, reading Derrida or Lyotard? Or uh, Guattari, uh, try read the or uh, well, I, I, Lacan. I, tell you, I, I took a class from Hürgen Habermas. Do you know who that is? You took a class from Habermas. Are you kidding me? Hürgen Habermas. Where did you get? To, where did you meet him? I met him. I took his class at Northwestern University in the '90s when I was there. And Nikos, you'll be delighted to know that I could not understand a word he said. Whatever, whatever language was, what was he speaking? Was it German? I don't know what he was speaking, but I couldn't understand a word. <laughs> so but let me tell I you have something. a signed copy of one of his unintelligible books. Of all the people I mentioned, Habermas is considered so simple in his writing that he's like he's writing on a Sunday newspaper. You should, if you found Habermas <laughs> unintelligible, 
You should try Derrida and uh, Lyotard. Well, I, I'd probably get more out of the blank painting than any of these guys, but we'll certainly keep up the conversation with our audience on, on uh, Clubhouse in just a moment. Definitely encourage you to check out Ayn Rand's Romantic Manifesto and become a member of what we're doing here uh, at the Ayn Rand Center UK. We are students of objectivism. And you know, Rand's whole conception and understanding of art, which is so vital to life, it's not just a little add-on at the end. This is so much of what makes life uh, 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 enjoyable. I think Dr. Peikoff at one point calls aesthetics to cashing in a philosophy and kind of like that's where the rubber, if you will, this is my interpretation, really meets the road. So become a member, fuel what we're doing, fuel yourself in the process. Nikos, any final words before we kick it to club? Yeah, final words. Perks for members. We said some weeks ago when we did the episode on Joko Willing, if we get 10 new members, we are repeating the workshop we did on extreme ownership and you get the free companion of how many pages is it? 40, is it 40? Probably it's even more. Pages of a, a review of the book, but also an objectivist inspired take on the main lessons of the book. So we're going to repeat this workshop this Sunday. I'm not sure. I think it's at two o'clock UK time. Uh, so don't miss it this time if you miss it the first time. When we first did it, we had very few members. Now we have three times the members we had. So probably we're going to have more people. This Sunday, two o'clock on as part of the Productivity Hub we review Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy Seals Lead and, Week, Lead and Win, the book by Joko Willink and Leif Babben. And again, you get access to this companion that I created, Electronic Access, and I'm very, very proud of because it's good lessons, good examples from real life and popular culture. And for the principles, you get examples also from mine Run books and Ayn Run heroes and counter examples. It's going to be good fun. Well, it's just so awesome, Nikos, because as you said, I mean, look, I took a class from Jurgen Habermas. My parents, I'm sure, paid a lot of money for it. But ultimately, what does it matter? Because I didn't remember it. It didn't really mean anything to me. But the chance to meet with uh, teachers like you, like Jim Valiant, like Dr. Binswanger, like Tara Smith, all of these really smart uh, professors, uh, philosophers, students of objectivism, it certainly makes my life better and I know our audience as well. So thanks for all the work that you're doing with the, the center and our audience as well. Should we kick, kick at the clubhouse? Yes. See you in clubhouse. Thanks everyone. We'll see you.